Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome uh, to Grace Church Sandbach and to our video stream this Sunday morning. If you don't know me, I'm Paul, and I serve as a pastor at Grace Church. And if it is your first time watching, we're so glad you're able to join us. This morning, we're going to be thinking particularly about the good news of the Lord Jesus and how it is good news, uh, not only for people here in Sandbach, but for the whole world, uh, a message that God wants the whole world uh, to hear about. And we're going to be thinking about our role, not only in sharing that good news, but also in praying for the good news of the gospel of Jesus to, sh to go all the way across the globe. Uh, so let's start by hearing uh, God speak to us in his word. And this is a psalm, Psalm 67 from the Bible. And it's a psalm that really is a prayer, a prayer that God will indeed make uh, his greatness known all the way across the globe. Uh, so uh, let's read this psalm now. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Let's pray together now. Lord God, loving Heavenly Father, we come this morning to give you our praise. We praise you because you are the God of grace, the God who loves to give unconditional gifts to your people. We praise you because you are the God of salvation the God who sent your son, the Lord Jesus, into the world to save even sinners such as us. Heavenly Father, we confess this morning that we are sinners, that we have gone our own way, that we have turned our backs on your way, that we deserve your anger because of our sin. We do not deserve to be able to draw near to you, but Father, we praise you for the salvation that we find in Jesus. Uh, we praise you, Father, that the Lord Jesus came into the world and gave his life on the cross in our place as our substitute for all who trust in him. And Father, we pray that this good news of salvation would indeed go across the globe. We praise, praise you that your salvation is for all peoples from all nations. And we pray this morning that in all the parts of our time together, that we, you would help us by your Holy Spirit to praise you, to praise your son, the Lord Jesus, as you deserve. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now our brilliant old hymn, a glorious hymn about the Lord Jesus, who is, whose name is the name high over all the universe. And the one we have the privilege, if we're Christians, of sharing uh, with others across the world. After the hymn, uh, Ben is going to come and speak uh, for, uh, to the children particularly, uh, then Bob is going to lead us in prayer, and then Kat will bring us our Bible reading.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to this morning's children's talk. And this week, we're finishing off our, our little series um, looking at Easter. So let's begin. Let's get our listening ears on. And we begin with two friends walking from Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus. And they were well, they were a bit confused and they were rather sad, I'm sorry to say. See, they were followers of Jesus and they were trying to understand everything that had gone on. They'd been following Jesus around and listening to what he said and uh, seeing all the miracles that he'd done. And they thought, this must be the Messiah. This is the one that's going to save us. He's going to save his people. But then... Everything seemed to have gone wrong, hadn't it? Jesus had been arrested and then put to death. And that seemed to be it. Maybe Jesus wasn't the one they were looking for. But now they'd heard from some women that had gone to the tomb uh, three days later and found it empty. The stone had been rolled away. And angels had appeared to them and said, Jesus is alive. They didn't know what to believe. Had someone taken Jesus' body and taken it away or or could it be that Jesus really had come back to life so they were walking along back to Emmaus maybe that's where they lived from Jerusalem trying to make sense of it all talking through these things and then up along next to them came another man a stranger someone that they'd never seen before and he saw that they were, well, feeling a bit downcast and asked what they were talking about. And they were a bit surprised. Well, haven't you heard everything that's gone on in Jerusalem these last few days? But the man said, well, I'm not sure what you're on about. Why don't you tell me? So they told him and they told everything that they were worried about and everything that they were confused about. And the man seemed to take it all in. And then he said something really strange. He said, how foolish you are and slow to believe. Well, that's a very odd thing for a stranger to say, isn't it? Just to come up to you and say, oh, what a fool you are. How slow you are to believe. But then the man started to talk about the Old Testament, the, the Jewish Bible that had been written down over all those years. And he started to explain that the whole of the Old Testament was all about Jesus. It was all about the promises God had given to his people. That one day he was going to send someone to come, a Messiah. And the man explained that actually Jesus was that man. Jesus was God's saviour, God's Messiah. Now, the two friends were amazed by this. It says in the Bible that their, their hearts were burning within them. They were so amazed and excited at this news. But they got to Emmaus and the man was ready to go off. They, they'd stopped. They were going to stop for the night. But they persuaded him. They said, no, please come and talk with us some more. Stay with us. So the man agreed and they sat down for their evening meal. And the man took it upon himself. He took the bread and he gave thanks to God for the bread. And then he broke the bread and started giving it to the two friends. And at that point, something miraculous happened. The two friends suddenly realised it wasn't just the stranger who'd been talking to them all this time. It was Jesus himself. Jesus had appeared to them. And Jesus had stopped them from recognising him. But now... Suddenly they realised it was Jesus. Jesus really was alive. And as soon as Jesus had made himself known, suddenly he disappeared again. Wow, the two friends were amazed. Well, what were they going to do? Well, they had to tell someone about it, didn't they? Didn't they? And who better than the disciples? But the disciples were back in Jerusalem. So back they got on the road and they went as fast as they could back to Jerusalem. And they found the disciples and they said to them, it's really true, it's really true, Jesus is alive. Now, 
I think you'll agree, it's a pretty amazing story, isn't it? And I think it's a really good story because it tells us about, about the Bible, really, doesn't it? It tells us about how the Old Testament really was all about Jesus, all about God's promise to send Jesus into the world. And then now we've got the New Testament, haven't we? Which was written down by those who met and saw Jesus and wrote about Jesus. So it, it shows us that the whole Bible from Genesis all the way through to Revelation is all about Jesus. How he was promised, how he came to earth, how he lived on earth, how he really died and really came back to life and really changed the world forever. So that now, even almost 2,000 years ago, we're still here, we're still talking about Jesus. And we're still showing that he's still alive and he can still be, uh, he still is king of the universe, isn't he? isn't he? And he can still be king of our lives too. Right, I hope you've enjoyed the story. Uh, I hope you enjoy the uh, activities you've got in your Sunday school books as well. And I'll see you all soon. Okay, bye bye. Let's pray together, shall we? Father God, thank you for this wonderful access we have now, the privilege of coming to you as children to our Father, and all because of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you died the righteous for the unrighteous, that you might bring us to God. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for assuring us that we are God's children and for giving us the confidence to come. We pray for our world in all its need, so much sorrow, so much injustice, so much inequality. We pray for the international tensions, the jostling for power, the despotic regimes. And we pray for your kingdom to come throughout the earth, O Lord, as the gospel is proclaimed and as you bring more and more people into submission to the Lord Jesus. Thank you that all of history is moving towards the time when the kingdom of this world will become your kingdom and Jesus will reign as undisputed king forever. We remember our friends in the Middle East as they prepare to return to the UK uh, this summer. Please help them with all the emotional challenges of leaving behind so many they've got to know and to love. Bring fruit to your praise and glory, O Lord, from their friendships and witness over the past 10 years. Please provide for all their practical needs of accommodation, employment and schools for the kids as they settle back in Nottingham. Cause us as a nation, O oh Lord, to humble ourselves and to acknowledge your kindness to us in so many ways. The progress with the vaccination, the easing of restrictions, the reopening of retail and hospitality sectors and sports facilities and so much more besides. We pray for the people of Sandbach in particular, that we would see a turning of their hearts to you, the living God. We ask that you will continue to provide opportunities for your word to be proclaimed online and one-to-one, -one, and that you will be powerfully and sovereignly awakening faith in those who hear. We remember those uh, who are sorrowing among us, especially Helen and her sister Jill and the wider family. Comfort them, Lord, and give grace and strength with each new day and courage to face the weeks and months stretching out ahead of them. We remember Elaine and her sister Susan in the loss of their dad. And there are those who have concerns for family members living at a distance. We think of Anna especially. Thank you that Janet is back home. Please will you uphold her in her ongoing weakness. And now, Lord, as we listen to the reading and preaching of your word, we want to know the power of your spirit at work amongst us, stirring our hearts and sending us out into the coming week to make the best possible use of the time and to live to please you in our family life, in our workplace, and in all our relationships, 
both inside and outside of the church. And we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Good morning, everybody. And this morning's reading is from Colossians, and it's chapter 4, and it's verses 2 through to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Amen. Well, as we look at that passage together, let's start uh, by turning to God in prayer. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, as we listen now to your words, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, throughout history, there have been many great speakers uh, from Abraham Lincoln uh, to Martin Luther King, speakers whose words changed lives, uh, people whose words are still well known today. And throughout the last 2000 years, uh, there have been many great speakers uh, who God has raised up to proclaim the good news about Jesus to vast numbers of people. Just one in the 18th century was George Whitfield. Uh, crowds of uh, up to one occasion, 25,000 people uh, gathered to hear George Whitfield preach the good news of Jesus outdoors with no microphones. And today there are gifted evangelists uh, like Becky Manley Pippert or Rico Tice, uh, people who God has used mightily in saving many people. And we thank God for people like that. But this morning, uh, the Bible addresses you and me if we're Christians, and it says God is calling you to speak. How do you feel about that? God is utterly committed to making his son Jesus famous all across the planet so that people from all nations might be glad in him, and he's committed to using your words towards that goal. Now we've been following the Apostle Paul's letter to the Christians in Colossae. And a few weeks back, uh, at the start of chapter three, we saw how God has made us as Christians into new people, people with a new identity, people who are in Christ. Uh, we have died with Christ to our old life. Uh, we have been raised with Christ to new life. And now our life is all about Christ. He is our life. And since then, Paul has been fleshing out a little bit about what that means, what that looks like in practice. And we've been thinking about what our new life in Christ looks like uh, in the church, uh, in our families, in our workplaces. And now in the section that Kat read for us, uh, we turn to the subject of prayer and of how we share the good news of Jesus with those who don't yet know him. Now, when we think about famous speakers, great evangelists, I don't know about you, but I sometimes feel I can get a bit discouraged. I'm just not like they were. But the good news is that is OK. God is not calling us to be brilliant speakers who could hold a vast crowd with our words. But he does want you and me to become better speakers for the sake of the gospel. And the kind of speaking that he calls us to is something that we can all grow in with the Holy Spirit's help. God can use your words in his great mission to make Jesus world famous. We need to be uh, good speakers. And here is how you can be one. There are two simple things in this section about how God wants us to speak. Here's the first one. 
we must speak to the Lord about people. We must speak to the Lord about people. Uh, there are no more important words that we can say for the spread of the gospel than the words that we say to God. Uh, verse two, devote yourselves to prayer. Now, on one level, we might breathe a sigh of relief at this point. Uh, perhaps we think that compared to standing up and giving a talk about Jesus, devoting ourselves to prayer, well, that might seem rather less daunting. Here's something that all of us can do. But actually, it's not that easy, is it? Uh, John mentioned last week the danger of the preacher being a bit of a hypocrite in urging people to live in a way that he himself fails uh, and falls short in. And I certainly feel that this morning. I'm thankful that my calling as a preacher is not uh, to lecture you about things that I've got sorted in my life. There's a book that um, uh, Paul Tripp uh, wrote called Instruments in a Redeemer's Hands. And the subtitle is really helpful. People in need of change, helping people in need of change. See, as I talk to you this morning about prayer and about evangelism, sharing the good news of Jesus, this is what I am. I am a Christian who needs God's help to grow in these things, sharing with you what God says about how both you and I can grow. Devote yourselves to prayer. How devoted are you to prayer? Now the word uh, devoted there, it has the sense of persevering in prayer, keeping at it, not giving up. It's the kind of praying that Paul and Timothy were doing for the Colossians. Uh, chapter 1 verse 3, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Always. He keeps on praying for them. You can picture Paul uh, there in his prison cell, uh, hungry, uh, tired, distracted by his own situation. And he has to steel himself that he is going to pray for the Colossians uh, like he did yesterday and the day before and the day before that. Now, as well as Paul's example, they also have the example of Epaphras. Uh, and he was the Christian who first told them about the Lord Jesus. And in chapter 4, verse 12, Paul tells them that Epaphras is always wrestling in prayer uh, for you. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? isn't it? Prayer is not an easy thing. It is a wrestle. It's like going three rounds in the wrestling ring. Uh, we have an enemy uh, who does not want us to pray. He doesn't want us to pray because he knows that the prayer of a Christian is powerful and effective. Uh, James 5, verse 16. Uh, we have to deliberately and intentionally pray. Otherwise, we will not pray. But it is so worth it because God works mightily through the prayers of little me and little you. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And what does Paul mean by watchful? I think the context suggests uh, verse two is about praying for fellow believers in the Colossian church. And that would make best sense of verse three, where Paul says, pray for us too. And Paul says uh, a similar thing to the Ephesians in chapter six of Ephesians in the context of spiritual warfare. Uh, he says, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. So the sense seems to be they need to be alert. They need to be watchful as they pray for one another. Alert to one another's needs. Alert to the spiritual dangers that are surrounding them. Picture an army, uh, an army battalion in, in France in World War II. Uh, and night falls uh, and they need to get to sleep. But one of them has the responsibility of being the night watchman. Uh, staying alert through the night keeping his eyes open so that he'll be quickly aware if his fellow soldiers are going to be in danger. And so too, in our prayers for one another, are we watching out for each other? Are we praying for one another, conscious of that spiritual battle? And then as well as watchfulness, uh, Paul calls us also to thankfulness. 
as we pray, we have so much, don't we, to thank God for all the extraordinary things he's done for us in Jesus. And time and again throughout this letter, Paul has been encouraging them to be thankful to God. And so verse two urges us to talk to the Lord about people, uh, particularly about our fellow brothers and sisters in the local church. Are we doing that? If we find that a struggle, do, do make use of some of the things that can help us. Meetings together uh, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday evening uh, to pray for one another. Please do join one of those if you've not already. You'd be so welcome. Uh, praying through our monthly prayer diary. There's another one of those coming out over the next day or two. Please do be praying uh, for things through that. Uh, giving someone a call, uh, finding out how they are and praying for them. And then in verse 3, Paul turns specifically to prayer for the proclamation of the gospel, uh, the proclamation of the good news of Jesus to people who are not yet Christians. And pray for us too, Paul says, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. At the end of our small group Zoom uh, meeting each week, uh, we usually spend some time sharing things to pray for and then praying for one another. What kind of things do we ask for prayer for? Well, how much we can learn from Paul's prayer requests. You see, if I found myself in prison because of preaching the Bible, preaching about Jesus, I think I would be asking for prayer for things like my safety in the prison, uh, prayers for my family, uh, back at home, maybe praying for the lawyers who are trying to represent me and trying to make an appeal. And none of that would be wrong. It would be right to pray for those things. But what does Paul most want them to pray for him? For God to open doors, but not necessarily the prison door, but rather for God to open the door for, a, for the message, for the word, for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus and his death and resurrection. A door to open for Paul uh, to tell people about Jesus whether that's people who are with him there in prison or whether it's people outside. See, he has such a heart for people uh, that their salvation is more important to him than his personal comfort and whether he's in prison or not. It is his love for people and his longing for people to be saved that causes him to end up uh, behind bars in the first place. Paul is in chains. But as he says in 2 Timothy, God's word is not chained. Uh, God's word can break through every chain, through every barrier. It can break through every closed door. It can break through the closed hearts of our neighbours and our loved ones and our friends. And so Paul says, pray for me. Please pray for me, pray for opportunities for me to share the good, life-giving, liberating news of the Lord Jesus. Our theme of God opening doors uh, reminds me of our brother and sister Liz and Ben uh, over at Wheelock Heath. Uh, for years they, they trained and, and they prayed and they prepared uh, to go out to West Africa to proclaim the good news of Jesus in Ivory Coast. And yet God's plan was different. Uh, God allowed the situation in Ivory Coast to deteriorate. So it was impossible for Ben and Liz to go there. God closed that door. But instead, God opened another door uh, in the neighbouring country of Burkina Faso. And they spent several years there telling people in Burkina Faso about the Lord Jesus. May God make us a people who pray for open doors for the message of Jesus. Uh, may he make us a people who talk to God about people. Most of us are not called to preach, but what a great impact we can have through our prayers. Can I say thank you to the many, many of you who pray for me in my preaching. I need those prayers. Thank you. Remember what Paul said back in chapter 1, verse 28. 
said, Christ is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. You see, no preacher can proclaim Christ in his own strength. And in fact, I so often feel my very great weakness. But Christ's great energy works so powerfully in the weak preacher, enabling him to preach. So let's pray for that. And let's pray too for those who are leading Christianity Explored courses. Let's pray for those who teach children in Sunday school or in youth groups. Let's pray for those who speak at outreach events. Uh, let's pray for those proclaiming Christ in other ch local churches. Let's pray for Tim over at Wheelock. Let's pray for our mission partners in different countries across the world. Monthly prayer diary that we get is a, a great resource, isn't it? Uh, for pointing us to different people that we can be praying for. And as well as for an open door, what else specifically should we be praying for? Verse four, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Clearly. That's striking, isn't it? Uh, Paul's prayer request is not for great eloquence. It's not for a, a brilliant style. It's not for things that we might think would make his preaching outwardly impressive. Rather, his desire is to be clear so that no one who hears can miss the central truths that he's telling them about the Lord Jesus, about Jesus' death for our sins and about Jesus' glorious resurrection from the grave. In Jesus, we have the best message in the world to share. And every Christian has a vital role in the progress of the gospel of Jesus. Do we long to see more people come to Jesus here in Sandbach? Uh, do we long to see the nations be glad and praise God as they come to salvation in Jesus? If we do, then may God make us more and more a people who are on our knees before him. Lord, have mercy on us who are so often lukewarm. May God help us to grow in our speaking are speaking to the Lord about people. And then in verses five and six, we turn to the second way that God wants us to grow in our speaking. Speak to the Lord about people. And now secondly, speak to people about the Lord. Speak to people about the Lord. Verse five. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, Paul is speaking here to ordinary men and women and children in the Colossian church. And he's saying, yes, you must pray for those who preach. But you also have a responsibility to speak about Jesus to others too. So what precisely is their responsibility? What is the responsibility of every Christian here? In the more word for word ESV translation, uh, there's a word that appears uh, at the end of each of the first, uh, sorry, each of the two halves of the passage. And it's a word that helps us to see the different roles that Paul speak, uh, of Paul speaking on the one hand, out of the speaking of the ordinary Colossians. Uh, so verse four finishes, pray that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. And verse six concludes, uh, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now that little word ought uh, has a sense of, this is something that must happen. It's something that will happen. God has planned that it will happen. And so if we think that the main responsibility for talking about Jesus belongs to the professionals, then we've got it wrong. Uh, the Colossians ought to speak to people about the Lord. Uh, they must do that. And so must each one of us if we're Christians. 
But that is also that Paul's role and the Colossians' role are not identical. Uh, Paul must proclaim the gospel. God has called him to preach. But the Colossian believers, on the other hand, they're not called to preach. They're called to know how to answer when people ask them questions. And I hope you can see there's something freeing about that. Uh, God is not calling Christians in the workplace or in the home or in the pub to awkwardly shoehorn the gospel into every conversation. Taking the example of the workplace, we saw last week that God calls his people to work hard at their work, uh, to have a godly submissive attitude uh, uh, towards their employer. And to remember that the one we're ultimately serving is in our work is the Lord Jesus. Primary purpose of going to work is to work and to do that well for God's glory. Now, God doesn't send us into the workplace to be preachers. But God does call us to speak. And verses five and six tell us how we're to speak to people about the Lord, whether neighbours or friends or family or colleagues. So take a minute now uh, to think about who are the people who you are likely to get into a conversation with tomorrow. Perhaps people in the office, perhaps in a Zoom meeting, perhaps at the school gates, maybe on the phone, maybe on social media. Can you think of at least one person? Now notice how Paul puts two things side by side. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Now, here are two ways that you could speak uh, to that person that you're thinking of uh, tomorrow. Uh, you could be so eager to tell them about Jesus that you storm in there and you force an unwanted conversation on them and it just puts them off. Uh, or it could be that you uh, you won't drop the conversation when it's quite clear that that person uh, doesn't want you to carry on with it. Or alternatively, uh, you could be so fearful that even if a great opportunity presents itself to say something quite naturally about Jesus, you bottle it. Now, we're all in the same boat on this, uh, and I've made both those mistakes uh, plenty of times. But do you see how Paul's instructions here help us? We need to be wise in the way we act towards those who are not yet Christians. Yes, we want to talk to them about Jesus. And after all, uh, in terms of wisdom, Paul's already told us that all the treasures of wisdom are found in Christ. Being wise certainly doesn't mean that we avoid talking about Jesus, but it does mean we need to be tactful. We need to be thoughtful. Uh, we need to be sensitive. Uh, we need to think uh, before we open our mouths. It means we want to make sure that there's nothing about the way we come across that causes offence. Now, of course, people may well be offended by what we say. The message of the cross is offensive to people and it always has been. But we want to be wise. We want to make sure that if people are offended, they're offended by what God says and not by how we say it. And yet I wonder if for most of us, it's the second half of the verse that we need to hear even more. I think I do. Make the most of every opportunity. In our desire not to offend people, it is so easy, isn't it, to keep quiet altogether to not use the time that we have, the opportunities that we have uh, to share Jesus. It's absolutely right that we want to build relationships with people first, rather than forcing the gospel on them the first time we meet them. But there's also the opposite danger to that, that we spend years perhaps building relationships, but we never have the courage to actually mention Jesus to them, perhaps even when there's an opportunity that we could have taken. If you're a Christian, as you go to work tomorrow or to school, as you pick up the phone to call someone, will you pray before you do that for opportunities to talk about Jesus? And will you pray for courage and for wisdom 
to see those opportunities and to take them. Then in verse six, Paul again puts together two helpful phrases. Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Full of grace. Uh, here, it probably doesn't mean uh, it's not referring to telling people about God's grace, although, of course, we want to be doing that. Uh, rather, the phrase here is about the way that we speak in our conversations with people, being gracious and winsome in how we come across. I recently ordered a book that um, arrived in the post just a couple of days ago. It's called Being the Bad Guys. I've not read it yet, but it's about the huge shift in Western culture in how people view Christians. It wasn't all that long ago that Christians were seen as the good guys. Uh, people may not have wanted to follow Jesus themselves, but they generally thought that Christians were people with good morals. But today that has been turned on its head. And each year that goes by, Christians who insist on believing everything the Bible teaches are viewed not as the good guys, but as the bad guys. Uh, we are, we are uh, uh, the ones uh, who are seen as holding views that are not just out of date, but immoral, hateful, views that are not to be tolerated. But in the last section of the book, uh, uh, it, 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 the chapter is called Being the Best Bad Guy You Can Be. Being the best bad guy you can be. And that is Paul's point here. People may not like our message and they may not like us because of our message, but we need to be gracious in the way that we speak. If people hate us because we follow Jesus, so be it. Jesus tells us that we ought to expect that. But let's speak in such a way that people have no valid reason to hate us. Remember Jesus himself on the cross. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When we get flack for being a Christian, or maybe worse than just flack, may God help us to be gracious, just like our master was. Gracious in how we respond. And yet at the same time, being gracious doesn't mean that we avoid talking boldly about the Lord Jesus. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. Uh, the sense here, it's not entirely clear, different commentators take different views, but a lot of the commentators think uh, the sense may be that salt gives a, a positive taste to the food. It, it makes the food pungent, uh, in a, a food that would otherwise be dull and unattractive. And so if our speaking is seasoned with salt, then it doesn't fade away into the background. It is willing to be different. It is gracious, but it's willing to stand out and speak about Jesus. So what is the goal of all of this uh, for the Colossians and for us? Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Most of us are not called to preach, but God does call all of us to be ready to answer, to speak about the Lord Jesus when those opportunities come up, uh, when those questions come up, and to make the most of those opportunities when God gives them to us. How we speak matters. Uh, God's plan uh, is to use your words and my words to bring about the eternal salvation of people across the nations. So may the Holy Spirit help us to speak to the Lord about people and to speak to people about the Lord. Let's finish, shall we, uh, with, a, with an old hymn, although I think it's an old hymn with a modern chorus called Facing a Task Unfinished. And let's pray as we sing that God will help us to be a people who are bold in sharing the good news.
Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Please do join us also this evening on Zoom if you're able to for our um, evening service. And if you need some details, do get in touch with me and I can pass those on. Uh, but for now, let's close, shall we, uh, by praying some of those words of that psalm that we started with. Lord, would you be gracious to us and bless us and make your face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. Lord, may the peoples praise you. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. You, our God, bless us. Please, Lord, would you bless us still so that the ends of the earth will fear you. In Jesus' name. Amen.